Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for showing up. My name is Carol Moore. I'm one of the uh, heart surgeons at uh, Minneapolis uh, Heart Institute. I would like to thank the foundation for allowing me sharing uh, some of our uh, experience uh, with you today. I will talk about some of the uh, complex aortic cases, uh, surgeries we did recently, and I will focus specifically on treatment of uh, acute type A uh, aortic dissection. Uh, I have uh, no disclosures related to this talk, and uh, I would like to uh, try to convince you today that the presence of uh, aortic team available at all times to uh, evaluate and treat patients, as well as a uh, hybrid room, is necessary to uh, treat complex type A aortic dissections and uh, create a situation where future reintervention is not necessary and uh, uh, the ability of treating, um, uh, of treating the all malperfusion syndrome that patients present with is actually uh, feasible. By the end of the day, I would like uh, everybody to understand the benefits of multidisciplinary approach to complex aortic pathology, identify the patients that can benefit from complete aortic reconstruction in type A dissection, and uh, be able to describe the strategies of cerebral protection during complex aortic surgery. We'll focus today uh, primarily on type A uh, Stanford aortic dissection or type 1 DeBakey. Uh, those are the dissections when, uh, those are the aortic dissections where the uh, pathology involves the whole aorta, which is ascending, arch, and descending aorta, including very often uh, the visceral segment of the aorta. Those are the sickest patients. Those are actually the type of uh, uh, type A aortic dissections that we most commonly see in clinical practice. Uh, I'd like to uh, um, I'll share some techniques with you that will take us from this complex aortic problem with a huge fenestration in the aortic arch dissection involving ascending and descending aorta to this situation where the whole ascending aorta, proximal part of the aorta is completely repaired, descending aorta is stabilized, it's remodeled, there is no uh, perfusion through the false lumen, and uh, uh, the true lumen is completely re-expanded. Instead of dealing with the uh, chronically dissected and chronically expanding aorta uh, throughout the segment after traditional approach and the need for uh, future reintervention that usually are uh, very morbid. So what is our goal in treatment and this complex repair? So the goal is to thrombose the false lumen of the aorta and promote the remodeling or the healing of the aorta. You probably heard it, uh, heard it many times. You heard it from us multiple times. Why are we so obsessed with the thrombosis of false lumen? So um, is, uh, the, the, the data regarding the, uh, the patency and the, uh, the importance of, the, of thrombosis of the false lumen uh, starts, uh, it comes from a, a treatment of type B aortic dissection. So the signature trial is the instead excel trial. It's a randomized control study that was completed in 2013, that was published in 2013. It was a study where uh, patients were uh, randomized to two groups. It was type B acute aortic dissections that were treated in the subacute phase. It was uh, two weeks out. Um, and the treatment was uh, based on uh, optimal medical management. That was one group. And the other group was optimal medical management with TVAR that was uh, placed uh, in, a, uh, in a subacute phase after two weeks of uh, uh, treatment. And uh, the goal of the study was to uh, compare mortality, uh, aortic-related uh, uh, mortality need for the reintervention and expansion of the uh, ongoing expansion of the, uh, uh, of the aorta. What they found was that the all-cause uh, risk of mortality after five years was not statistically significantly different, but uh, it was 11 in the TVAR group versus uh, 19 versus, uh, uh, versus 19 in medical group. However, aorta-specific mortality was significantly different between those two groups. Um, and then uh, the progression of the, uh, of the uh, disease was significantly higher in the, uh, in the medical group versus uh, TVAR group. Uh, the analysis uh, in, the, uh, in the phase between two and five years, this was analysis that was done because the trial was, com uh, was divided into two uh, portions. The first one was completed at two years, and then the uh, instead, XL was um, uh, completed at five years. What they found that the, uh, between the two and the five years um, uh, time point, the patients uh, that were treated with TVAR, mortality was zero because the aorta was stabilized versus 17% uh, in the medical group. Aorta-specific mortality exactly followed. So all the mortality uh, came from aorta, which was 17% uh, versus, uh, versus zero and the progression also was significantly different. Um, 
So uh, this was the uh, this was one of the uh, really uh, the signature uh, moments when uh, when the focus on the thrombosis of the false lumen was really uh, uh, was really found to be was really found to be uh, to be important. The similar experience uh, then the the whole idea of uh, stabilizing the proximal uh, descending aorta during the type A acute aortic dissection trickled towards uh, towards the uh, cardiac world. And uh, this is one of the first trials. Uh, it comes from uh, it comes from Austria. This is uh, only group of 14 patients that uh, underwent complete uh, uh, total aortic arch uh, replacement with frozen elephant trunk, uh, with uh, stabilization of the proximal uh, descending aorta with the uh, with the stent graft with the frozen elephant trunk. What they found was that at uh, uh, 12 months. Uh, all patients uh, in the group uh, had complete obliteration of the uh, false lumen, and um, already 64% of them um, had a decrease in size of the uh, of the descending aorta, which means that uh, the aorta already started remodeling. Let uh, let me take you through uh, two typical approaches for um, uh, type aortic dissection. So this is kind of a traditional historical approach that all of us are uh, uh, trained to uh, uh, to do in our uh, surgical training. So what happens when we when patient presents with type aortic dissection? So we obviously confirm it on the uh, CTA. We need to examine the patient, make sure neurological uh, status is uh, intact, or if there are any deficits, we need to identify them. Complete vascular exam with pulses. We go to all our patient goes on bypass. We cool the patient usually to moderate or deep hypothermia between 24 to 18 degrees of Celsius, and then we uh, after cross clamping the aorta, we address the root address the valve, resuspend the valve, or replace the root, replace the ascending aorta when patient's cold, we open aortic clamp, and we perform the operation, which is called the hemi operation, uh, under deep hypothermic circulatory arrest, and look for tears in the, uh, in the aortic arch and try to address those tears. Uh, the operation looks like this. This is what, they, what we are always told. There is a tear in the ascending aorta or aortic root. Aorta dissects. We need to replace this portion or a little more extended uh, towards the arch. And then it, uh, the false lumen beautifully thrombosis and patient's healthy. It would be really great if not for the fact that, you know, for decades we were lied to in our training. Because it turns out that there are significant limitations to this approach because the need for the reintervention, specifically aortic reintervention, is 20 to 30 percent at, uh, at five years. And depending on the, uh, depending on the literature you look, uh, you look at, false lumen patency is up to 100 percent. I mean, that sounds terrible when you think about it. Up to, five, up to 100 percent. And what happens is that usually the fenestrations that we think we find during the surgery in the ascending aorta and aortic arch are never the only ones that exist because there's multiple tests throughout, uh, throughout the whole aorta. And currently with, uh, with the imaging modalities that we have, we are able to actually identify them preoperatively. The problem also with this traditional approach that uh, the need for intervention in the future usually creates a situation when there is no landing zone for the endovascular management because the aortic arch is dissected and dilated as well as the descending aorta. Branch vessels very often are uh, involved, so we have to perform complete arch replacement, which are very complex operations. Very often those patients that uh, they need to undergo a uh, further uh, reintervention are older, sicker, and they're not really candidates for the operation anymore. And there is a significant risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia in the thoracoabdominal aneurysm uh, uh, treatment, which, uh, which we all uh, are aware of. So uh, this is uh, what, uh, what we recently came up with in terms of uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, approach to uh, treatment of type A acute aortic dissection. So when, we, when the if, uh, phone call is placed and we hear that patient with type A aortic dissection is coming and is accepted by our center, we meet in emergency room. Uh, we have cardiac team, vascular team, and anesthesia, and anybody else is actually necessary. Let's say we hear that the patient has uh, malperfusion syndrome. We will, uh, we will place a phone call uh, to uh, general surgery to meet us and uh, formulate a plan for acute treatment. But those are really uh, those are the key components of the team. Examining the patient, neurological complete vascular exam, and then we review the images. We look, uh, we look through the CTA and look for the uh, uh, for the size of the aorta, root, arch, we look for fenestrations, and we preliminarily formulate a plan of surgery. How my, how, what, what's going to be the extent of surgery? What's the risk of the patient? We look at the comorbidities and how we want to uh, approach it. We go to a hybrid room every single time. 
uh, patient uh, we discuss uh, uh, we discuss the strategy for cardiopulmonary bypass hypothermia, hypothermia cerebral and spinal protection strategies and the cannulation strategies as well as what we're gonna how we're gonna uh, approach intravas uh, intravascular ultrasound and whether there's a need for immediate imaging especially in patients with malperfusion syndrome because of our interdisciplinary approach, this is what we achieve. We can address malperfusion simultaneously with a proximal repair, and this way we can maximize elimination of tertiary arch and proximally sending aorta. We work from two ends of the patient, basically. Vascular uh, surgery starts, uh, uh, starts the approach from the groins. We start from the uh, cannulating, uh, cannulating in the, um, uh, on top in the chest. The arch, vessel, uh, the arch vessels are repaired first. Uh, it gives us shorter cerebral and spinal ischemia and eliminates majority of the dissection flab, flaps from the head vessels. In cases of, um, in cases of, a, uh, of a need for future uh, reintervention, we create a situation that majority of problems can be actually addressed endovascularly without a need for a re uh, complex uh, open uh, procedure. And this is what we really aim for in um, um, uh, any patient that is eligible for this surgery. So debranching of the head vessels, uh, ascending aorta is replaced, root is repaired or replaced, and the frozen elephant trunk is sewn to the ascending graft. Head vessels are over sewn. Everything's fixed. If there is a need for reintervention, it can be accessed from the bottom uh, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the endovascular techniques. Uh, the main difference between what we do and what, uh, uh, what our colleagues uh, present here is that our frozen elephant trunks are uh, shorter and the reason we do it is um, uh, the reason we do it is that we uh, minimize the risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia. We also uh, uh, avoid doing a traditional frozen elephant trunk uh, operation, which uh, uh, where the head vessels are in anatomical position. This way, we avoid an uh, avoid area of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and it, uh, we don't need to uh, operate uh, in the in the field where we can potentially injure it. And again, the frozen elephant trunk. Is shorter and we risk the spinal ischemia uh, less. Uh, majority of our patients get cannulated uh, via axillary approach. This is a graft sewn to the axillary aorta. This is done simultaneously with uh, a vascular team approaching uh, one of the groin vessels, either right or left, depending on what we find on the CAT scan and which leg is fed uh, through the pulse or through lumen. They approach the uh, aorta with the intravascular ultrasound. That allows us to identify the true lumen, the false lumen. This is what it looks like in reality. It also helps us to identify uh, the visceral vessels intraoperatively and uh, uh, evaluate any dynamic versus uh, static obstruction. So we can see the vessel, uh, the vessel rising from the aorta in the visceral segment. The probe is right here. This is the flap of the, uh, of the dissection. And uh, very often patients present with malperfusion after uh, inserting the intravascular ultrasound and uh, passing the wire. Uh, the vessel opens because of the dynamic obstruction that is alleviated uh, during the uh, uh, IVOT performance. If, it, if the obstruction is um, uh, static and there is a flap intersocepted into the one of the branch vessels or there is a tear, uh, this, uh, potentially this branch has to be immediately opened with the wire or potentially stented later or initially to, uh, so, uh, to resolve the malperfusion syndrome that, as we know, are very legal. Uh, how we, uh, the, the way we protect the brain, with our uh, strategy is uh, selective, then uh, immediately followed by bilateral anti-grade cerebral perfusion. We use the uh, anti-grade cerebral perfusion technique with the flow about one liter per minute, which is about one milliliter, milliliter per kick per minute. We go to deep hypothermia, uh, 18 degrees of Celsius, it gives us uh, a huge margin of safety for the spinal cord and uh, uh, cerebral, uh, uh, cerebral uh, uh, oxygenation, and every patient has bilateral uh, near-infrared spectrophotometry monitoring probes on the for, uh, foreheads for, so we can uh, identify any, uh, at any point where, when there is uh, hypoxemia of the brain on either side. So how does it work? So we cannulate the right axillary artery. This is aortic arch. We occlude the innominate artery. We occlude the left carotid artery, and we occlude left uh, uh, subclavian artery. That has to be obviously completely mobilized. The moment when patient, we are ready to open the aorta, we, the flow on the cardiopulmonary bypass goes from four liters, which is kind of the average, to one liter, and then basically bypass supplies upper body and the head. Um, at, at the same time, because of the branches of the vestibular artery, posterior spinal artery and anterior spinal artery supply the uh, top portion of the uh, spinal cord. 
on top of, uh, in combination with deep hypothermia, the safety margin for the spinal cord is huge. The fact that we create a frozen elephant trunk that is short, we avoid, um, uh, we avoid the risk of uh, spinal cord ischemia. This is what it looks like in the operating field. Uh, the head vessels are uh, divided from the arch, they're occluded, and then the trifurcated graft that is here is sewn to the head vessels. There is a wire sticking out from the, uh, from the aorta that is delivered from the bottom by the vascular team. When the uh, graft is completely anastomosed, the clamp goes here, and then the upper, upper body is completely perfused via our partial cardiopulmonary bypass. And at that time, we uh, uh, deploy the frozen elephant trunk in integrated fashion over the wire, so we know that we deploy it into a true lumen, that we don't cross any fenestrations, and don't create uh, a potential malperfusion uh, by our actions. Then we, uh, when we're ready to do ascending aorta, we oversaw head vessels. Uh, the frozen trunk is uh, already deployed, and we saw the ascending graft together with some reinforcement, usually with felt. We saw it together with the aorta frozen trunk to create a complete seal, and then combine those things together, clamps come off and patient is completely reborn. So we have a complete uh, repair of the head vessels, arch, uh, proximal descending aorta, ascending aorta root. So basically the whole aorta on the, in the proximal aspect is fixed. And that's really the, uh, this is really what we, uh, what we aim for. So let's look at some of the patients that we recently did. So this is a patient, a 43-year-old male, type 1 dissection. He presented in Duluth uh, with shortness of breath. He has a history of Marfan status prospectus excavatum repair, never had a CT, but they definitely fixed his chest. Uh, he presented with uh, respiratory failure, was placed on bypass, asp uh, they uh, suspected aspiration, they intubated him. Turns out that on the echo patient has severely dilated LV with the uh, EF of 20 to 25 percent and severe, uh, probably chronic AI. They also saw the flat. They got, they got a CT of the chest. Uh, it turns out patients had a type A, uh, a type A, type 1 dissection. The flap uh, ends in the proximal descending aorta, just this to left subclavian artery. Uh, patient was accepted by us, uh, came to us intubated on pressors. He was completely metabolically deranged, potentially malperfused with elevated lactate liver failure and renal failure. Without thinking uh, too long, we looked at the uh, CAT scan. This is what we found. All head vessels were dissected. Uh, aortic arch is dilated. It's also uh, dissected. There's a huge fenestration in the proximal descending aorta. There is a, uh, uh, there is a hematoma in the mediastinum. As we can see, ascending aorta is severely dilated, and that's his root. It's a humongous marfanoid-looking uh, uh, aortic root. Uh, and, the, uh, and the, as you can see, the uh, patient has still uh, some remnants of the pectus. Left ventricle is large, is displaced to the left side of the chest. So it seems like fun. Patient comes to, uh, patient was immediately admitted to ICU. Uh, we were uh, consulted, cardiac and vascular surgery, um, and patient went to OR for the uh, emergent repair. And that's what we did. We replaced his root. We used uh, composite uh, valve graft. Uh, we, did, we used biobental in this situation, and uh, I will explain later why. Uh, we reimplanted his coronaries, we replaced his arch with the trifurcated graft, and deployed the frozen elephant trunk to zone zero, which means proximal part of the, uh, proximal part of the arch. Uh, Acetating aorta was replaced, and uh, uh, the operation was completed. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the data from cardiopulmonary bypass. We did it under deep hypodermic circulatory arrest with undergrade cerebral perfusion. The circulatory arrest time was only six minutes, which means that upper body uh, for a majority of this time with the brain and spinal cord were perfused. Lower body ischemia was 94 minutes at this, uh, at this uh, temperature, completely safe for any organ in the, uh, in the body. Um, before we uh, came of cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, we decided, we obviously, uh, we had a TE probe. Uh, patient uh, went to OR in severe, severe profound cardiogenic shock. Uh, the discussion uh, took place with uh, a heart failure team that was involved from the very beginning. Dr. Samara was on call. And uh, the, before take, coming off bypass, we decided that we're not going to come off bypass. We're going to place patient on uh, axillary ECMO. We already had a cannulation site elected, and patient was placed on temporary mechanical circulatory support because of very depressed EF, and we did not want patient to progress into metabolic acidosis and uh, derangement. This was his uh, x-ray after uh, the operation. As you can see, the chest is open. The sternum is not wired yet. This is the root. There's a frozen elephant trunk across the arch. The lungs are clean. Uh, patient was immediately placed on the uh, evaluation list for, um, uh, for LVAT because of the depressed EF. 
we decided that if the patient needs a mecha uh, implantable me uh, mechanical circulatory support, we will do it right away within the first three to four days. Uh, the liver and the kidney completely healed without, uh, within the first day. Uh, head CT was normal. We did it because we did not know the patient very well. Uh, and on EEG, patient had no seizure activity. Uh, two days later, patient, uh, patient's chest was closed. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like when we went back to the OR. So this is uh, patient's aortic root. It's partially covered by the heart. That's a normal view. Ascending aorta sewn to the uh, frozen elephant trunk that goes into the arch. And this is the trifurcated graft that goes of ascending aorta to the innominate artery, um, uh, left uh, carotid artery, uh, uh, and uh, left subclavian artery. Uh, this is the view of the proximal aortic arch mobilized there. This is combined ascending aorta to the root. And uh, that's what patient looks like after the chest closure. Um, patient did actually very well, did not need LVAT implantation. He has pretty stable hemodynamics despite having depressed, um, uh, depressed uh, uh, EF. Uh, we uh, explanted his ECMO at the bedside. He got extubated a few days later and uh, transferred to telemetry uh, uh, 10 days after uh, index operation. His EF remained at 20 to 25 percent. And uh, this is what uh, his CAT scan looks like. So as we can see, the arch is completely sealed with the uh, frozen elephant trunk. This is the ascending trifurcated graft. There is no, uh, there is no flow outside. The descending aorta is completely uh, sealed and there is no flow through uh, a false lumen at this stage. This is his arch again. That's his root with the re-implanted left main uh, artery. This is how the trifurcated ground comes off uh, the ascending aorta. There is a residual flat in the innominate uh, artery that should not cause any problem in the future. This is where the anastomosis is. This is his left carotid, also with the residual flat and uh, left subclavian artery uh, here. And this is what his uh, aorta looks like uh, in 3D uh, imaging. So as you can see, the aortic root, ascending aorta arch are completely fixed. There is no false lumen. Trifurcated graft comes off uh, ascending aorta, and uh, arch vessels are uh, supplied uh, from that uh, arch. And uh, two weeks out, this is what patient looked like. He was discharged and went back to Chicago and will be followed at the uh, Loyola Center. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the second patient that I want to talk about is uh, uh, DS. Uh, patient is 72 years old, uh, so not, uh, not the youngest, uh, here, but overall pretty healthy. Uh, uh, his past medical uh, history was significant for diverticulitis that was treated uh, medically, uh, and he uh, did well without surgery. Otherwise, a uh, healthy guy. He presented to us typical uh, a presentation of type A dissection, uh, chest pain, uh, as you can see, a very complex uh, tear uh, in the uh, ascending aorta, uh, first tear in the root, second tear in the proximal arch, bovine arch with the innominate artery and left car common carotid artery arising from the common, uh, from the common ostium. As you can see, the uh, arch is uh, completely uh, dissected and there's a huge penetration in the arch, absolutely impossible to repair it uh, with the traditional technique. This is his uh, complex uh, dissection in the ascending aorta, as you can see. False lumen is compressed in the descending aorta. That's always a, a significant problem. There's some pericardial effusion in, uh, in the pericardium. And as you can see, some of the, uh, some of the uh, visceral, visceral vessels, which is the left uh, renal in this case, uh, are supplied from the, uh, both false and true uh, lumen. So uh, we thought, well, uh, older guy, maybe we shouldn't do this operation. But we convinced ourselves, uh, uh, convinced ourselves otherwise and we performed uh, uh, this operation on this gentleman. So uh, his aorta was, uh, ascending aorta was replaced. The aortic valve was actually repaired with the suspension technique. Um, and we subsequently replaced his uh, arch vessels with the uh, trifurcated graft and uh, deployed the frozen elephant trunk uh, in the proximal descending aorta across aortic arch. Uh, the uh, circulatory arrest time was uh, 19, uh, 19 minutes. Uh, this is his completion angiogram. Uh, we can see the ascending aorta here. This is the frozen elephant trunk starting in the proximal arch going across the arch and proximal descending aorta. This is the trifurcated graft going to uh, head vessels. This is root, and this is the pigtail catheter that uh, uh, Dr. Tyros inserted into the left ventricle tissue because she wanted to feel like an uh, interventional cardiologist. So uh, uh, she kind of went nuts. Uh, and this is, uh, as you can see, the visceral segment, um, this is the injection, the visceral segment. Um, uh, the, the visceral vessels are well uh, supplied now, left 
uh, and uh, I'm sorry, right and left uh, uh, renal arteries, uh, celiac trunk with branches. There is some residual flow through the pulse lumen, but you'll see on the CAT scan that it's just a very limited segment of the uh, of the residual dissection. Patient was extubated post op day zero, transferred to the floor post op day one. Um, post op day three, he developed chest pain. Obviously, when I heard about it, I was in a typical uh, cardiac surgical denial. It seems impossible that my patient's having a chest pain. But uh, uh, thank God, one of the cardiologists on the floor uh, sent him for a, a, to a cat lab, and uh, this is where the problem was. There was a proximal uh, LAD uh, infarct uh, that was uh, uh, then uh, uh, immediately uh, fixed uh, by Dr. Mooney uh, and with good reconstitution of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, flow and uh, his EF returned completely to normal. Uh, I just uh, actually just two days ago was going through the char patient's chart and I found that Dr. Mooney dictated that it's a, not a complication immediately related to surgical procedure, and I thought it was very nice he put it in the chart. <laughs> and and with, with the typical Mike statement, a very nice result was obtained. So uh, post-operative course was, uh, I would want to say, uneventful, but it wasn't uneventful because patient developed, was doing quite well on the floor, just rehabbing 70-year-old guy. And post-operative for, uh, post 14, he developed abdominal pain, turns out, uh, he had a, a he, the white scan was elevated. With a, we got a CAT scan, and uh, he had a perforation of his uh, uh, diverticula diverticulosis affected uh, uh, sigmoid colon, and he underwent heart transplant procedure with end colostomy and was discharged 10 days later um, uh, without any septic complications. Uh, he will return in the in the spring for the reversal uh, of his uh, colostomy uh, to reconstitute the uh, the continuity of his uh, of his gut. And that's what he looked like in the clinical visit when he came back to see us. So overall, he's rehabbing. He still has a little peripheral edema, normal EF, normal biventricular function. And uh, uh, that's what his CT looks like. So that's, what, that's his ascending aorta. This is a trifurcated graph takeoff. This is descending aorta. As you can see, there is no residual false lumen, uh, completely uh, sealed frozen elephant trunk. That's the arch without any uh, uh, fall, uh, flow through the false lumen. There is a residual flap. Uh, in the uh, distal thoracic aorta. Um, that's, again, arch, that's innominate artery, common carotid. This is left subclavian. Again, arch, this is the trifurcated graft taking off. That's a turn between the ascending and the frozen elephant trunk. And you can see uh, uh, his uh, dissection and <coughs> there. So he has a short dissected segment in a visceral portion of the aorta. This will be obviously followed with, uh, with CAT scans. And uh, if there is a need, he can underwent limited procedure uh, in this portion without doing a paraca abdominal or arch surgery at age of 80 or 85, which is almost impossible. Um, one patient that uh, um, some of them may recognize uh, or may know, uh, this is a patient uh, with Lowy's uh, deep syndrome. It's a very, uh, as, we, as we know, very aggressive uh, aortopathy. It was first described in uh, Johns Hopkins in 2005. It's a mutation in the TGFBR1 and 2. Um, uh, what, uh, what it, uh, what, what, what it uh, causes clinically is um, it affects uh, basically every uh, single uh, um, system in the body, but the most important uh, is that it creates a lot of arterial tortuosity and propensity to have, uh, to have uh, aortic and uh, vascular catastrophes. Uh, patients usually have those complications very early in the uh, teens and 20s, uh, if they're not followed, they uh, don't live very long. Uh, this is the um, a recent review from Johns Hopkins uh, from 2017, uh, published in JTCVS. This is the experience with Lois uh, syndrome uh, patients. They had 79 of them, which is a really significant number for one institution. Uh, the first operation uh, usually was done at uh, age 25, so as you can see, it's really early. Uh, 20 of them in this series already had a redo operation, so they had surgeries even earlier. Uh, 19 of, of those operated patients required uh, a re a subsequent operations later, but overall at 10 years survival is 88. And this is, the, this is the survival that you can achieve if those patients are truly closely followed and any intervention that has to be done is done uh, in timely fashion. So we had an opportunity to treat recently one of, uh, one of those uh, patients. It's a 36-year-old male that uh, uh, over the last uh, few days uh, underwent those operations. At age 22, he had a type A dissection. 
and he had his aortic roots replaced with mechanical composite valve graft, which is a bental procedure. Uh, in 2009, he had a dissection of his left vertebral artery, which was then coil embolized in Duluth. Um, in 2011, he underwent redo upper hem hemisternotomy and the right subclavian carotid artery aneurysm uh, repair because he started developing uh, a proximal right axillary artery um, aneurysm. In 2012, uh, he underwent um, a descending aortic stent graft placement for possible rupturing pseudoaneurysm. He had a spontaneous, basically, bleed in the periaortic uh, uh, tissue in the descending po uh, part of the uh, thoracic aorta. Um, and uh, at that time, we also noticed that uh, uh, he, uh, his right subclavian, uh, uh, right subclavian uh, artery aneurysm continued to um, grow. In 2016, uh, uh, he underwent verti uh, right uh, vertebral artery ligation. Uh, the reason was that uh, on the CTA, it looked like this was a main feeding vessel to this right subclavian uh, aneurysm. Unfortunately, that did not, did not solve the problem uh, with enlargement of the right subclavian uh, uh, arterial aneurysm. And uh, just recently, um, uh, we reviewed his case and decided that uh, we will address the um, ongoing uh, enlargement of the right subclavian uh, uh, aneurysm and also his ascending aorta at the time was significantly elongated, was over four centimeter which, uh, centimeters, which for low with these uh, syndrome patients is an indication to, um, uh, to repair it. So uh, uh, this is what we, what we needed to deal with. So that's the right subclavian aneurysm. As you can see, we are at the level of arch, so that goes really deep into the right chest. As you can see, he's a pretty, a pretty big guy. Uh, lung, lung fields are not very, not very small. That's his ascending aorta in the portion that was not replaced by the composite graft, so significantly larger than descending, and that's uh, that's the three D reconstruction. So this is the graft, and here this is the ascending aorta enlarged, arch enlarged. This is the takeoff of the innominate artery. The aneurysm is here; it's not reconstructed here. He has a pseudo aneurysm of the left subclavian artery, and this is the stent graft from the uh, from the previous uh, operation. Uh, that was performed. So we decided the operation should be easy, um, and uh, uh, we went through uh, uh, through a planning of the uh, of the procedure. So the discussion was: should we do it at uh, at one approach, or should we stage it? And how how should we stage it? How should we plan for cardiopulmonary bypass? How should we cannulate? What type of hypothermia should we use? And the biggest question is: <clears throat> I'm sorry, how the hell are we going to approach all the uh, all those areas at the same time? So uh, uh, we had few options, right? We could do sternotomy. That's what we know the best. But the problem is that uh, from the sternotomy, it's very hard to reach the subclavian arteries, and the angles are very difficult. Plus, this would be a third redo, so uh, probably a lot of adhesions are uh, very, uh, very difficult to uh, reach. Uh, maybe sternotomy plus thoracotomy, but the question is how many thoracotomies we're going to do. Both sides plus sternotomy seems a little excessive. Plus. Sometimes navigating between two separate fields can be much more challenging than people think. Um, what about the clamshell? So clamshell is partial sternotomy with an extension to thoracotomy. Well, maybe, but then we would have to do a dual clamshell, so it doesn't kind of make sense either. So maybe sternotomy plus hemi clamshell. Well, that could be okay, but the one of the sites still is, uh, is not uh, uh, addressed. So we decided we're going to go with clamshell, which is the um, old school, old fashioned uh, uh, bilateral thoracotomy with transverse sternotomy. Uh, I wasn't sure whether this is the best approach, so I, I called one of my mentors to, uh, to ask whether we would be able to really reach to all those areas, and this is the answer that I heard on the phone about the clamshell incision. Uh, so he said that through a clamshell we'll be able to see another OR if you need to. Uh, so it's a, really, it's, a, it's, a really great, it's a really great access um, to, to extensive thoracic surgeries. You can basically access any organ in the, uh, in the body, and uh, the reason is that this is what it looks like. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, our patient, but this is the clamshell incision. So you go uh, in submammary uh, crease, uh, you divide the sternum, you extend the incisions uh, to the left and right about mid-axillary line, but then the intercostal spaces you open all the way to the spine, so literally you can break patient in half, uh, and uh, uh, you have access to lungs, neck vessels, heart, heart vessels, hyla, descending aorta, literally everything that you have to uh, address. So uh, we, decided to, we decided to stage this procedure. First, uh, we did the left subclavian left carotid bypass, 
And uh, uh, the reason we did it is because uh, we wanted to basically uh, recreate the situ re recreate the anatomy of the right side with innominate artery dividing into the sub uh, into the subclavian and uh, uh, and right carotid. We wanted to recreate the similar functional anatomy on this side, and I will tell you why in a moment. First, uh, we wanted to uh, we wanted to bypass uh, we wanted to uh, uh, cannulate through uh, right left subclavian. Subsequently, we, uh, the plan was to uh, ligate the left subclavian uh, artery to address the proximal uh, pseudoaneurysm that was present in the left subclavian artery. Uh, and the reason was that this was already replaced by interposition graft in 2012. And on top of that, there was this close to 10 centimeter uh, aneurysm sitting on top of that. So really, this area was not available for cardiopulmonary bypass, and we needed to identify strategy to uh, protect this patient's uh, brain and patient's spine during this complex, um, compl uh, complex operation that we obviously wouldn't know how long it would take. Um, so the bypass went uh, uh, very quick. Uh, patient got extubated uh, uh, next morning and uh, recovered well. Second stage was done uh, to, uh, two days later. A patient received right and left arterial lines. That's a standard for our uh, type A dissections. Uh, and left axillary, uh, left axillary cannulation was performed. Uh, right groin cut down, and uh, we created. Uh, we went uh, through. Um, we created a clamshell uh, incision. This was a high clamshell. Normally, it's performed through a uh, fourth intercostal space. We went one space above in order to really be able to get to all the uh, arch and, uh, and head vessels. Um, uh, plus, we did a, a typical um, uh, thoracosternotomy. Mobilized everything. There were a fair amount of adhesions around the heart and aorta. And uh, uh, we completed the cannulation centrally for the venous drainage um, and um, uh, cardiopedia uh, lines. And then uh, circulatory arrest uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, performed. We started with the branching of the arch vessels, uh, restored the upper body uh, circulation, deployed the frozen elephant trunk, did the ascending aortic graft to frozen trunk anastomosis, and then we sewed all the pieces together. We took clamps off and started rewarming, and it was evening, and we started at 8 a.m. So we decided that uh, we should take a break because probably we will be uh, we won't be able to actually finish, which was we still needed to do the right subclavian aneurysm that was on the size of a small melon. Um, it was basically draping all the venous uh, venous vessels uh, uh, over uh, over the, the the aneurysm itself, and the right uh, phrenic nerve was also um, involved. So uh, we kept the, uh, the chest open. We packed uh, the patient's chest. The patient was hemodynamically very stable. Biventricular function was normal. Um, and the patient went to ICU for resuscitation and um, uh, rest. Uh, 36 hours later, he uh, returned to, uh, to the OR to uh, complete the, uh, the aneurysm and uh, uh, get rid of the aneurysmal sac. Uh, when, when we uh, open, reopened the patient, we uh, identified the thrombosis of the left innominate vein, uh, which uh, we thought after performing actually a thrombectomy and a bolectomy that probably the thrombus was the present there before, but the operation itself and, uh, uh, and uh, packing of the chest, I think, completed the, the process. So we needed to, uh, to fix that. So uh, we uh, thrombectomized the, the left innominate vein and reconstructed with the pericardial patch, uh, uh, reconstructing the whole area of confluence of the left, uh, right innominate vein, and the SPC. And this is what uh, anatomically uh, it looks like. So uh, you can see this is the uh, right innominate vein. This is the left innominate vein. Usually this one is already uh, behind the clavicle and the sternum. Superior vena cava, there's an azygous vein that uh, sneaks in uh, into the SVC behind the heart from the right. You, you also have to control it. So you need to occlude all those branches. And without using cardiopulmonary bypass, we just made a long incision, removed the clot from this area, and patched the whole front to enlarge the size of the, uh, of the vein. And this is the patch over there. This is ascending aorta. That's a trifurcated graft. And uh, a little closer look. So that's the patch. The, the vein goes to the left side of the chest. This is the right innominate vein. The aneurysm is already resected. As you can see, this is the shiny thing is the right lung. So it already is in the, in the place of the aneurysm, which was there. This is a closer look to, the, to, our, uh, to our grafts. Again, this is the bifurcated graft that went to the head vessels. Uh, ascending aorta uh, patch. 
And this is the CAT scan that was uh, done uh, one or two weeks out. So this is the first operation he did. This is the route. That's our ascending aorta. Uh, Trifurcated graft taking off from the ascending aorta. Frozen elephant trunk starting here. You can see the, uh, this is the innominate artery. This is his native innominate artery. It takes this funny turn. We left it in place. That was not causing problem. This is our uh, uh, graft for the head vessel. Good seal here. Descending aorta with the frozen elephant trunk and his previous uh, stand graft that was deployed, that was placed in 2011. As you can see, there is a distance between uh, between those two stand grafts. That was planned based on the imaging. We know there were some uh, significant size intercostal arteries in order to avoid spinal ischemia. Uh, Dr. Titus measured very precisely to leave the uh, to leave few centimeters free and not occlude any of those intercostals. Um, and that's uh, that's what his whole reconstruction uh, looked like. This, this, this funny tube next to the aorta is a feeding tube, so so don't think that we placed it there. Um, so uh, you can see ascending aorta to the root. This is the trifurcated graft. Uh, this is his head, head vessels debranched. We cannot see the bypass that was done two days prior um, uh, with the, uh, from the left subclavian to the left carotid. But that's the fully reconstructed aorta. Patient was uh, extubated post of day post of day two. Uh, he required some BiPAP support. Uh, he was uh, initially fed through nasogeginal tube, uh, spent in ICU one week, and then was discharged to telemetry. Uh, unfortunately, six days after um, uh, after a transfer to telemetry, he developed pretty significant bleeding from uh, from the nose, required fucking rain intubation because of the um, airway control, and he underwent uh, embolization by IR uh, times two of his um, uh, of, of the of the vessel supplying uh, supplying the naso uh, naso parings that was successful he the extubated and he spent with us uh, around uh, one month and he uh, this is his visit in the clinic you can see this is the clamshell incision it's healed uh, the, it ends um, uh, in the uh, mid uh, axillary line the true incision actually goes around all the way to the spine as his previous sternotomy incision there is one uh, sternotomy incision from from before, I, I wanted to take a one-shot selfie with with him, but uh, Dr. Titus required some time to actually get ready, and there's the final <laughs> view. There's the final view. Um, so uh, the multidisciplinary team approach uh, is it, really what I think makes those those cases successful. So uh, when we say uh, we're from CB surgery, we're from C surgery, V surgery is vascular surgery. So we, we really need to be aware of it because uh, we, those cases cannot be performed by by single person. If we want to do it, we're not going to be as successful as we can be. Uh, anesthesia. This is a really key uh, a key component of the of the team for those cases. Uh, the planning starts in the emergency room when we evaluate the patient for the first time. Uh, we need good uh, nurse anesthetists. We need good anesthesiologists. We need to plan for blood product resuscitation. We need to plan well for cerebral protection. We need to plan well for spinal protection. We need to make sure that if there is any hypoxemia of the brain that happens intraoperatively, we immediately hear it and we're going to address it. And the, the anesthesia, anesthesia thing is really a key component of it. Uh, we need cardiologists. We need interventional cardiologists that will fix our problems with coronaries. Or we check our coronaries while we are on the OR table. Dr. Gossel was invited once. and. Uh, we had a, a depressed uh, EF uh, after uh, one of those cases, and uh, I called Mario and asked to do a coronary angiogram. And while he did it, the LV recovered, and we all confirmed that coronaries were normal after a root operation. Uh, so that's really important that we uh, that we have all uh, all those components. Heart failure team, uh, uh, the patient that came to us with 20 percent uh, uh, 20 percent uh, EF, we wouldn't be able to take him safely through it if we didn't have a temporary MCS and didn't evaluate him immediately for durable MCS as needed. The guy is good, uh, healthy now at home with, um, uh, with depressed EF, but he's doing fine. Uh, we need general surgery to address our uh, abdominal complications. We need a good ICU team to really take care of those patients because they need hour-to-hour uh, -hour supervision. Uh, we need neurologists to identify uh, any stroke complications that are early. We need interventional radiology to pull the clot out of the brain vessels if, if needed. And it has to be very, it has to be very expeditious. So uh, to answer the question, is hybrid zoom a necessity? I think it is. I mean, if you, we really want to do those operations successfully, we don't want to have a delay with treating the malperfusion, with treating complications. 
we need to go to Hyperzoom every single time. Um, and uh, what are the uh, uh, what are the, the benefits really of, of those operations? So we always have to look at the patient from the very beginning. Can patient undergo this operation? So uh, usually young people are the best candidates. The tears in the arch, the ones that we can re we cannot fix with traditional approach. This is the patients that really will benefit from this surgery. Any evidence of malperfusion? This is why the whole hybrid room is money because by placing patient on the OR table and doing IVOS and angiogram, we immediately address the, the malperfusion syndrome. We can support the patient with the bypass or mechanical support right away. Um, and uh, any patient with connective tissue disorder, those patients have to be very aggressively treated. We cannot leave aortic tissue behind and hope for the best in the future because the best will not happen. So looking at the case presented, we presented the patient that had low EF, came to us in profound heart failure, went on ECMO, was malperfused, and we had a 72-year-old guy, and we had a guy with multiple redo surgeries. Uh, last week we did uh, two of those. Uh, patients were both morbidly obese, one was 70-year-old, and uh, two or three months ago we did a, a patient that had fontula brand disease and had four of his joints, shoulders, and hips replaced, and he underwent this operation. So maybe the question for me when you weigh, uh, when you weigh the risks versus benefits, maybe all patients really should be undergoing this operation because it seems like we can get them through it. So in summary, uh, multidisciplinary approach allows simultaneous treatment of primary pathology in type aortic dissection, the proximal repair, and malperfusion complications because of we address the arch descending aorta and revascularization of the end organs because of the presence of the hybrid room and dual team. Cannulation strategy, hypothermia and addressing the arch vessels first allows uninterrupted perfusion to the brain and quick restoration of blood to the upper body. So the arch first technique, trifurcated grafts. Performing frozen elephant trunk and cross the arch instead of distal to left subclavian artery minimizes the risk of spinal cord ischemia. This is why we uh, do a debranching from the ascending aorta and not uh, anatomical uh, uh, arch uh, graft and complete, uh, complete hybrid proximal aortic repair, root ascending arch, proximal descending aorta, promotes healing uh, of aorta or remodeling of the aorta and decreases the risk of uh, future reintervention. Thank you so much, and I'll answer the question. Question? It was really a fantastic talk. Uh, Carl, so uh, thanks so much, and I <clears throat> I really appreciate the thoughtful approach you and and the uh, the other surgeons have taken to this. And I think it really builds off of you know for years we've sort of had a program based on the diagnosis and getting the patients here quickly, and the actual surgical aspect wasn't really approached. So this this is really great. I, the way I look at the literature, I think there's still some controversy on patient selection. Does every single patient need this? And, and you know, the most important thing is we get the patients through the operation without a, a stroke, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think your risk-benefit slide was, was great. I mean, it's definitely the connective tissue patients uh, for sure that need it, the younger patients, uh, et cetera. So I'm going to ask you the same question you asked Dr. Nianover, which is, these are big operations and requires a specific skill set. Are you guys going to move towards an aortic team uh, on call for dissection? Short answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have a we don't have a kind of final uh, final shape of it yet. We're kind of working on it. It's work in progress, but the answer is yes. We we definitely are aiming for it. I don't know how quickly it can happen. I think that functionally we do have aortic team. Uh, but obviously it uh, puts uh, more pressure on uh, uh, physicians that are kind of more involved. But I think that also those physicians will pre, uh, that did already and will uh, pre-select themselves from the group to kind of be uh, available for those cases. So the answer is yes. Fantastic talk. Maybe a stupid question. But if you don't have the vascular surgery team available at 4 in the morning, person on call doesn't do this, there are probably only a few who do, is there a way to do the surgery where they could come back in the light of day or two weeks later and complete the proximal portion? Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the, the proximal portion is mostly, uh, is mostly done by the, by the cardiac surgeon. Uh, it, really, uh, it really is the, I will, I will answer this way. 
the value of, uh, of uh, having a dual team approach is that we know the heart, we know the proximal part, they know the rest. So uh, patient, uh, th this is, this is uh, an ongoing discussion and dialogue in every single aortic meeting. What do you do if you have a patient with malperfusion? Do you start proximally? Do you start distally? Do you fenestrate? Do you stand? When do you do a second stage operation? So looking at uh, looking really at uh, how people try to solve this problem, looking at the literature from Michigan, uh, from UPMC, I mean, everybody tries to stage it. So uh, I feel that we have a pretty reasonable idea that is relatively unique here because we do two-stage surgery in one stage. And if somebody asks me, well, shouldn't you resuscitate the patient that comes with a uh, lactate of 12? and has abdominal pain. We know what's happening. It's a gut malperfusion. So my question is, how are you going to resuscitate the patient if you don't know whether it's a dynamic obstruction from above, whether it's a static obstruction from below, whether it's an obstruction of the SMA, celiac, or any of the other vessels? So my answer will be no. You have to go to a hybrid room, and you have to what you have to start with, you have to start with IVAS. You need to start with um, uh, the, with uh, uh, angiogram images, and then you have to decide really what's happening and what has to be done. If the patient is in profound, uh, cardi in profound metabolic shock, what I would say, fix the, uh, fix the malperfusion, open the belly, see what has to be resected, leave the belly open, put patient on ECMO, resuscitate the patient, six hours, 12 hours, return, finish the surgery. <coughs> The literature supports doing staged procedure because patients coming with malperfusion, if you get them through malperfusion phase and then repair the whole proximal aorta arch, they do well. But hey, nobody mentions the 12% of patients rupture in between the first and the second stage because that's what happens with type A dissections. They have some kind of complication that will kill them. So I think that with, uh, with uh, really this multidisciplinary approach and what we can achieve by having everybody involved, I think that the potential for saving almost anybody is much higher because we, can, we have mechanical circulatory support program, because we have, a, uh, we have angiosuite, we can do endovascular interventions. We have people that can address the, the, heart, the heart issues right away. So I think that, and so, if we don't have available uh, vascular surgeon, I think they're more available than cardiac surgeons, to be honest. They're on call, they're on call all the time in here. We're not. <clears throat> We're kind of the, 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 the more sluggish part. But uh, I truly don't see, uh, looking at, at uh, you know, I would say our last two-year experience, I don't see it being a problem. I think that the, everybody will be available. Now, that being said, you, you can do a kind of a deep branched surgical elephant trunk, not a frozen, uh, it would be a traditional elephant trunk, um, which um, it can also be done and then staged subsequently. But we find that uh, the current approach is, uh, cer uh, certainly has advantages over a traditional um, deep branching surgically placed elephant trunk, which, which could answer the question. But I do want to make a comment that, you know, we, we have the, um, the environment where we have so much talent in so many areas to allow this kind of uh, program to evolve, but you have to give Carol, you know, full marks for really dragging uh, the surgical, the cardiac surgical team into the this you know, 22nd century approach to this. This is not 21st century. We're really <laughs> ahead of the game in terms of how we're thinking about it, how we're approaching it today. And there's nobody around that uh, that that approaches these problems the way. That, that this team does, and, and I got to give Carol full marks for really uh, kind of dragging us and putting us there. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Moody. And on the way out, we've got Char Chuck Stark from Janssen here supporting us today. <laughs>